Hello and welcome to episode 22 of When Life Gives You Lemons Go Vegan, where I share people's incredible stories of transformation after adopting a low-fat, whole-food vegan diet to help alleviate the symptoms of chronic disease and to take control of their own health. On this podcast, I also interview plant-based doctors and other experts in the field of plant-based nutrition. And this week, I was lucky enough to sit down with Melbourne's own GP, Dr. Malcolm Mackay. So hello, Malcolm. Welcome to the show. Hi, Corinne. Thank you for having me on your podcast. Oh, you're so welcome. I'm so blessed to have you. I've been nutrition in medicine symposiums that were held by the wonderful Lucy Stegley at Raw Events with you in the last four months with Dr. Michael Claper and now Dr. Kim Williams just recently, which were both excellent. And so I was really looking forward to having you on the show. So thank you very much. Thank you, Corinne. Yes, they were both um, excellent events. Oh, so good. So I've given you a little bit of an introduction, but please, I'd love for you to explain your story and how as a medical practitioner, how you stumble, how long you've been, your vegan story, how you stumbled across a low fat, whole food, vegan diet, and how, how long and how that's worked for you as an individual, but also as a practitioner. So please tell us all. I'd love to hear. All right, Corinne, this goes back a very long time to medical school in about 1980. When the, uh, the, the crusty old cardiology lecturer was showing us all these uh, gruesome slides of what happened to our arteries as we got older and heart attacks and strokes and problems with circulation to the leg and erectile dysfunction and it was like and you know there are risk factors for this but it's all part of the inevitable part of aging but then shortly afterwards there was another lecturer who said who told us about um, groups in the world like the Highland Papua New Guinea people who never got artery disease at all. And so it got me thinking, and it's like, okay, everyone in this part of the world is doing the meat and the fat and the salt. And, and um, these people in New Guinea were eating just mainly just sweet potatoes. And so, you know, it wasn't long before I sort of put two and two together and thought, right, okay, I can have my cake and eat it too. I can have all the luxuries and, and security of the Western world, plus uh, I can eat the diet of the countries where they don't get heart disease. And as the course progressed, you know, over the next uh, few terms, I was always interested, like, oh, diabetes, what are the risk factors there? Oh, breast cancer, bowel cancer. And each time, um, nutrition seemed to be a big part of it and it always pointed towards, in reductionist terms, you know, low fat, low animal products, low salt, high fiber. In other words, predominantly whole plant foods. So, yeah, I was already in on this. And I also wanted to keep skiing all my life because I was a keen snow skier. Um, and I was getting back into, um, you know, I was about 20 years old and I was getting back into some distance running again. And it really seemed to work for me. You know, over the next couple of years, I, I sort of, you know, I ran a 232 marathon they did the, they put on one of the first triathlons in Adelaide and I think partly because of my running skills I came first in that so it, it really seemed to work for me my um, my peers all thought I was a little bit crazy maybe there's some truth in that <laughs> to this day I, I still quite can't quite understand why other doctors just don't see this I mean you know you know you don't have to be a genius go to the medical library or learn a bit about medical and health and learn about all these risk factors and learn about you know how much healthier vegans are or people on mostly whole plant foods, plant-based diets. You know, like it, it's sort of right up in front of you. It's sort of like hard to miss it. A year or two later, um, I found um, the books by Nathan Pritikin. And so I wasn't mad. Other people had seen the, the, the obvious as well. Um, and so I became quite involved in Adelaide in what was then the Pritikin Health Association, which was quite big in Australia in the mid-80s, you know, and we put on meetings, we'd get guest speakers. We even had someone talking about the gut microbiome in the late 80s. Um, sometimes I'd give the presentation. Oh, my gosh. I thought that was just brand new. <laughs> no, in fact, um, this particular person, I can name him, Dr. David Topping from CSIRO, said, uh, said uh, humans are like cows back to front. In other words, cows have the you know front stomach where they ferment the grass and we have the back bit of the gut where we ferment the food. You know, for the strict vegans out there, you know, some people say, like, I've been strict vegan for so many years. Um, I, I would have to add that, 
you know, my diet has a bit varied a bit over the years. You know, I got married, I had children. There'd sometimes be, you know, potato patties with some salmon in them. There'd sometimes be a family vegetable dish with some chicken and I'd pu- pull out the bigger chunks of chicken and then put them back in the pot. But I always live mostly on things like uh, porridge for breakfast and brown rice was my staple in the evening meal. Um, I, I can't ever say that over the years I ever ate any more than very small amounts of, you know, fish or chicken or whatever. And I was always oil-free right from the start. I mean, that was, that was again, a bit of a no-brainer, and Pretty can push that, you know. Back when he wrote his book in, I don't know, 1980 or before, it was like, here's the research that shows that oil also uh, damages, um, makes uh, blood flow less well. See, that's something that a lot of people, I think, are still, because there's such a, such a, Oh God, what's the word? Push, I think, for oil, you know, add olive, extra virgin olive oil to everything, you know, or coconut oil to everything. And it's just, you know, if you're vegan, it's like you have to love coconut oil in every dessert, you know, in every meal and in all of the people who are trying to be optimally healthy seems like oil is like, this is how you're optimally healthy. I'm pushing my hands forward. <laughs> I don't know why people can't see my hands, but, um, you know, the people are often pushing this extra virgin olive oils and coconut oils as a healthy, as a health food. So what do you say about that? Yeah, when you talk about how it's pushed and promoted, I mean, as far as coconut oil goes, you know, there's sort of no science that really pushes that. That's sort of like a snowball that sort of started rolling spontaneously and just gathered speed. Um Olive oil, I mean, there's been lots of research showing that, you know, diets that have some olive oil in it and have more fruits and vegetables and legumes and less meat and less junk food and less dairy. So it's the olive oil? No, it's a diet that's more plant-based. So there are lots of bits of research like that, you know. And then, of course, the olive oil researchers will say, look at the polyphenol on olive oil, we'll study this. They won't compare it with the polyphenols that are present in much greater amounts than foods like blueberries, spinach, even whole wheat flour has more polyphenols than olive oil. So you're you're talking here about the Mediterranean diet. Yeah, yeah. It's a more vegeta- It's a more plant based diet. That that's what it has. It's a more plant based, less less processed diet. Don't tell me people are focusing on the seafood and the oil, yeah. when they should be focusing on that. There's an abundance of plants that make that diet my, really my, good. Uh, my medical magazines often make me do a face palm, and one of the things is sometimes I see a Mediterranean diet described without mentioning, you know, something important like whole grains or even legumes, and focusing on the. Uh, on the fish and the olive oil. I must say the uh, the approach I take to people with oil, so as not to get into a big debate about whether it's, you know, olive oil is healthy or not, whether there's been some large-scale studies done on Mediterranean diets with olive oil, is just to say, <clears throat> open up a nutrition composition table. You know, I'm a bit out of date here. You know, look it up on your computer. And uh, have a look at olive oil. You'll notice that it has more than twice the calories of sugar, the maximum calorie concentration of any food. Have a look at the iron content, zero, calcium, zero, fiber, zero, protein, zero. Okay, you can close up the nutrition composition tables now because you can see that this is a junk food as far as being a food that's super high in calories and super low in nutrients and fiber. I cooked, um, um, I called it a Mediterranean vegetable dish I had on my rice the other night and um, I said that it had uh, unprocessed olive oil in it because it had some diced olives in it. That's the way to eat your olives if you're going to eat any. <laughs> great, great idea, great idea. Um, so I think we, into, we, we moved around a bit. So you went to uni and adopted a plant-based diet, a vegan diet, after, oh, after looking at all of the gruesome images and then you did some work with Dr. Pritikin? Yeah, I never met Nathan Pritikin. But, um, yeah, I did some work with, we had a Pritikin Health Association, which I was involved in, and there were a few recipe books and things, and I used to put together lists of references and recipe books that, and write out little diet sheets instructing people how to do, you know, a low-fat, low-salt, basically, more or less. This, a Pritikin diet, you know, the, the, the sort of maintenance version, it's a bit like Ornish, who sort of allows you to sort of not be so strict if you want to, but the strictest version of it's uh, nearly all whole plant foods. Um, and 
You know, and I had some enthusiasm. It did wane a little bit over the years in medical practice. I guess part of it was that patients would often only make very minimal changes. And with those minimal changes, you know, would only come very small benefits. Uh, but boy, some of those people with heart disease, severe acne, obesity, etc., who did the full-on um, uh, stricter version of the more whole foods, plant-based part of the Pritikin diet, they, they did very well. Over the years, you know, because of somewhat of a lack of patient interest and things and, you know, the busyness of having children and medical practice, maybe I waned a bit in how much effort I put into a medical practice, but it was always part of my practice to encourage people to move in that direction and to get up and do some physical activity. Uh, then sort of came a, like a, a rebirth, uh, you know, um, when I met Jenny Cameron on a chairlift in 2012. So <laughs> I love that story yeah, so I'd, much. I'd been divorced for two or three years at that stage. And, uh, and Jenny helped me with the social media. And then at that point, we heard how this Forks Over Knives documentary was coming. And the whole foods plant-based movement around about you know, 2010 was really beginning to take off in the U.S., as that movie pulled together all the big players who'd been working in this area for years, like John McDougall and Neil Barnard and Caldwell Esselstyn. So we started working on a website. By 2012, I moved to Melbourne to live with Jenny and decided, full on, full on, Jenny, this is my passion. This is the direction my medical practice is going to take in uh, in helping people to not just prevent. I've always been into the prevention, but I think until I connected with the U.S. movement, until I went to my first conference in the U.S. in 2000, October 2013, I don't think I really had a full understanding of just the power and breadth of effect of whole foods plant-based to not only prevent heart disease but to reverse it, to actually you know stop the growth of um, um, some prostate cancers, to you know put rheumatoid arthritis into remission, uh, and uh, MS even. With that conference um yeah that really helped me to launch me and i've been back to the international as they now call it um plant-based nutrition healthcare conference every year since i want to go to that conference so bad it's right it's just just all the other people at some of these events is um makes it a lot of fun i think i'd i think i'd pass out from excitement at meeting all of the doctors that I've followed for so many years. Yeah, yeah, I must admit we're, we're um, um, celebrity photo people, Jenny and I. Yeah, we're, we're always looking for, um, you know, get another photo with Rich Roll or T. Horn Campbell or, or someone. Yeah, yeah, we've got a whole collection. I'm glad. I'm glad you have. You have to make the most of it. Seize the day, I say. And last night we, uh, we registered online for the... Um, 2018 plant-based nutrition healthcare conference it's in san diego this year congratulations that's so exciting and i'm pleased to say that you know whereas not sometimes there's some gp online groups and doctors groups and um you know sometimes i've posted things on there and posted sort of a little bit out there about well um heart cholesterol and diabetes i mean you could just eat a you know vegan diet um, and normally they completely ignore all my comments and things. I say, I say to Jen, Jenny, you know what the other doctors have said about my comment? Yeah, that's right, nothing. But I, I, um, I put up some posts about the Kim Williams um, events and I've had about eight or ten people tick like. So I think something's happening out among the doctors. I think there's just some, a small number of them are really starting to see it. But overall, the whole mainstream medicine in Australia, it's like, they talk about treating cholesterol with just barely lip service to diet and nutrition. You know, if they're talking about heart disease, it's like Mediterranean diet. You know, it's sort of like no one wants to use the vegan, vegetarian sort of V words. And it's just sort of like Kim Williams at the meeting the other night was right out there. Like, look what happens in the research to the big groups of people like the Seventh-day Adventists, those that are vegan, how much better they do. When, when there's articles about prostate cancer and maybe not treating it too aggressively, you know, in the medical magazines, it's you sort of, it's a bit of why didn't you see Ornish's study where he's where they actually stopped the growth of sort of um, low to moderate grade prostate cancer. 
If they were, um, sorry, about prostate cancer, I just wanted to go into that. When In, in Ornish, I haven't read Ornish's study, um, but I will. Is it available online? Can you just read it online? Yeah, there's probably study? a link from, <laughs> if you go to my, um, Jenny and I, our, our website, Your, I will find, plantbasedhealth.com.au, yes. uh, I think you'll find a cancer section there and uh, there'll be a link to the 2005 publication where Dean Ornish took these uh, group of older men who decided that their prostate cancers were not growing particularly quickly, that they didn't want surgery, and so half of them did nothing, and the other half did the Ornish program, which does include some meditation and, and group sessions and some walking, as well as as a low-fat, mostly whole foods, plant-based diet. Did the men end up cancer-free? Like a lot, not all of them, but did a lot of the men end up cancer-free at the end? I don't think we could say cancer-free, but they did find that the uh, the biomarker for cancer growth, PSA, went down. They did some scans on some of them, and some of the cancers appeared to shrink. Interestingly, with Dean Ornish, um, you know, how Dean Ornish sort of offers a spectrum where you can take various levels. Like he, he upset some of the vegans by having a, photo, a picture of salmon on the front of one of his recent books. But Dean Ornish, um, I've seen a number of presentations by him, and he always says, you know, in his heart disease studies, in his um, genetic studies showing that, you know, the a- aging telomere sort of stuff gets better with his program, in the prostate cancer study, all of these studies, those that adhere more closely get better results. Do you think with Dean Ornish, I know um, because I have personally found this way of eating through the Roy Swank research on multiple sclerosis and he just from reading his stuff for a long time he has fish fish and oily fish and then he introduces like an egg a week or something and then after 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 a year and then i think he introduces a little bit of breast chicken breasts after that and his belief was that you know like lots of like, like um dr kim williams was talking the other day, a lot of doctors just think plant-based diets are just too hard for people to follow. So they give them these little, these, what they, you know, like little treat foods, like, you know, like f- fish and egg whites, thinking it's that, that'll help them maintain that diet, knowing that optimally they aren't health foods, but just that they think, well, oh, I don't know if you'll stick to it if we don't let you have a tiny bit of these these foods. Do you think that that's like putting the fish on the cover makes people go, oh, phew, I don't have to get rid of fish, you know, like I might read the book then if there's fish available. I don't know if it's, if they do that whilst knowing that the optimal would be a whole food plant-based diet, but thinking, oh, I'll hedge my bets and see if I get more people if I, if I add fish and eggs. This is just my own little stream of consciousness right now. You know, on the one hand, you know, a pragmatist, you know, if someone's not willing to do it 100%, then they're better doing it 90 or 95% than not doing it. So that's sort of a pragmatic approach to take. You know, like often taking with patients is not all, it doesn't always work to say you need to adopt a vegan diet. You know, it's often better to talk about, you know, hardly eating any meat and, uh, you know, things like that rather than just say, you need to adopt a vegan diet. Maybe if they just had a heart attack or an MS diagnosis or something and and they've seen it and they've actually got hope and that it's going to work, they'll do it. But um, the other side of that, though, is that it can open the floodgates. And once you tell someone with MS that fish is in there, the diet, like fish then becomes a regular food. Then whenever they go out, they get a 200 gram slab of fish because they just ask for the fish meal. Uh, And it's a little bit the same with oil. You know, when you tell people, ah, you can use a little bit of oil, then it's such super concentrated food. They they just don't realize how many calories of it they're having. And then, you know, it becomes you know, oil in lunch and oil in dinner. And then when they go out to a restaurant where the food is often really oily, because they're accustomed to eating some, they don't even notice. So, you know, although I'm somewhat pragmatic, I'm also a purist. And, you know, Andrew Spudfit Taylor will sort of tell you that, it's, you know, it's often, it's sometimes easier to stick to things um, 100%. And, you know, be all right if we lived in a blue zone. I agree completely. I, I, not to sound... 
my my husband's partner and lots of people think that I'm quite extreme, <laughs> which maybe I am. But to me, some foods I call them gateway drugs. <laughs> you, you have a little bit, and then it's just like you said about coconut oil. It's a snowball effect. You think, oh, because everyone has this. I'm sure I'm going to. I'm preaching to the converters. I've heard you talk about moderation before, but everyone talks about anytime you talk about anything to do with veganism. There's a whole band of people who'll say everything in moderation, which is my worst sentence. Like I actually hate hearing that sentence because we just don't do moderation well as a species, as far as I've seen anywhere. And if I have a brownie, I know that I'm going to want a brownie again tomorrow. I've just it, it just triggers something. If you have a bit of bread, you're going to want more bread. If you have a bit of fish, you're going to want more fish. We just we just tend to be that way I think you're inclined. Right, yeah, as humans, we're always pushing the boundaries, both personally, um, but even collectively. Like, well, okay, how much carbon emissions? How long can we keep burning coal and petrol and things before it really hits the fan? Like, you know, as sort of collectively as a species, we tend to tend to do this. Like, okay, if we've, and I think with nutrition, like. You know, our conventional nutritionists, you know, they find there's obvious, definite research, more than 450 grams of red meat a week definitely causes cancer. So let's stick to 450. <laughs> it's like, let's have, let's make that how much we have. And, and it's sort of like if you're looking at tobacco research and you said, well, we've never shown that more than less than three cigarettes, you know, it's only more than three cigarettes a day. So we'll have three a day. But of course... Also, I think when we sort of treat the, um, when we take the figure that's known to be the amount that causes damage, uh, and then we make that our sort of, we tend to make that our minimum, you know, on a good day. Yeah, exactly. I actually, now that I just I raised that without thinking, but um, if you could talk, I, in your talk I heard at, I know you, you haven't got your slides in front of you, so I'm putting you on the spot, so I apologise. But you, I remember you talking about moderation in that, and I think that a lot of people who are listening will be will be on in that camp of moderation and listening to this. If you could just expand a bit further about what is wrong with moderation, especially for people who have chronic disease. If you could talk, I remember you talking about it in that thing, and I thought this is such good, this is just, it's common sense, like, but you don't, we don't, often don't use our common sense. <laughs> so I loved hearing it. And if you could share a bit more about moderation, people with chronic disease, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, so like Corinne, we've sort of touched on how it's sometimes easier to do no chocolate cake than, you know, chocolate cake every few days, both to reset your taste preferences. Like I don't even like oily food now. You know, even food that's got a little bit of oil in it really doesn't feel nice in my stomach. It doesn't feel nice in my mouth. I guess we could just talk about it from a patient perspective. Like, If I was your patient and I was just talking about can I? Ha- how do you feel if I have, you know, three eggs once a week? Three eggs a week. You know, what would you advi- What would your advice be if I was really, if my cholesterol was very high? It was one of the plant-based leaders made some comment. It might have been Neil Barnard. Um, I think you've heard several of, the, of them say, um, moderation can give you the worst of both worlds. You have a feeling of deprivation because you're limiting or restricting something that you previously liked. But at the same time, because you're still having some of it, you're not actually getting the full health benefits. So you've got the the deprivation without the full benefits. That's such a that's such an important point because I think a lot of people that deprivation is almost worse than the disease for some people. You know, when you're depriving yourself of all these foods you love, and it's impacting on you socially, and it's impacting upon you eating the things that you're habitually eating your whole life. And so you're psychologically just thinking about those things and craving them all day. And then you're not getting better because you're not, you're still eating a bit of it. Like, And if you don't have something, um, you know, if you don't eat prawns, if you don't eat um, greasy snacks, if you don't eat cheese, then, you know, after a lengthy period of time, someone can walk around at a, at a social function with a platter of those and it's like not food. Like, you know, it looks like, well, it could be dog biscuits or it could be poly, you know, polystyrene blocks, but it's sort of, it's not my food. Whereas if someone was continuing to dabble in it, then it's still going to look like delicious food to them. I, I, I definitely in patients see the uh, problems of, um, of moderation. Um, you know, I've, in the last couple of years, I've 
I've seen a couple of people with rheumatoid arthritis who haven't quite got there. You know, the, their joints are still a bit inflamed, there's still inflammation, they'd like to get off all their drugs. But they're still doing a little bit of oil. They're staying overweight. And, you know, I think if someone says, look, I'm going to totally adopt a whole foods plant-based diet, um, try and go for a lower calorie density, if you could talk about calorie density later, energy density, um, but their weight doesn't really change much. You know, those who really do it and who are overweight, you see over the next few months, the weight starts to fall off. It shows that they've really made changes. Uh, but I find those with rheumatoid arthritis who keep using a little bit of oil, who don't quite stick to it, um, don't quite get the results. In, in heart disease, uh, I do remember one patient. It's like he, was he was like one of my post-child patients. I should have presented him as a testimonial, sort of like, you know, sort of bloke in his 50s, sort of, you know, who, who one day I asked him after a few visits, I said, did, was it me that you, did I, I didn't put you onto this to start with. He said, no, it only took me 10 minutes on Google and I found Esselstyn's book. But when I came to see you, you pulled Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease by Caldwell Esselstyn off your shelf. And I remember this man saying to me, you know, no, this is not at all hard to do at home. As a single 50-year-old male, it's easy cooking like this at home. It's not hard. Anyway, it was like sort of, that was the first year or so, like about two years into it, he sort of went off on a bit of a sidetrack about, you know, his approach to life and his um, plant-based diet and things. And next thing, I get a letter from the emergency department at the hospital. Mr. So-and-so presented with an episode of angina. Um, you know, and he hadn't gone back to eating burgers and and blocks of cheese. He just sort of slipped off a little bit. Um, yeah, so, you know, if you're a healthy, active, lean, 25-year-old, you know, without any disease, um, no doubt you could get away with more, you know, oil and animal products and things. But if you're someone who's already um, tipped themselves over, you know, through no fault of their own into, you know, diabetes, autoimmune disease, heart disease is already diagnosed, then there's really not much wiggle room um, to go outside of the, you know, whole grains, legumes, fruits, vegetables, a few nuts and seeds. Not even tons and tons of, not even too many nuts seeds and avocados uh, I often see that you know people get spooked by the ironically the Atkins paleo people with the grains and things and next thing they're piling in the nuts and the oils and uh, you know apart from the weight that generally it often it often doesn't seem to get the best results. I, I want to just fly where just fly you've mentioned the elephant in the nutrition room uh, paleo and Atkins and ketogenic diets I would love to hear. I recently got sent an article. My husband, my husband sent it to me about a man who's eating only bacon. Only bacon. He's now eats very, very, very few vegetables. Vegetables are his enemy and only eats meat and mostly bacon. And his blood results have become amazing. He's fitter than ever. He's thin. He's. Just the best of my husband was saying, well, look at this guy, you know, <laughs> he's eating all this bacon. And I was had my own thoughts, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on Mr. Young Bacon Man and all of the men out there who are starting on these carnivore diets and high, high, high fat, mostly fat protein and very little carbohydrate diets. Yeah, yeah, look, um, there will be a tsunami of chronic disease following on from this. Uh, interesting, you go back to, you know, 1980 and before, uh, and um, in regards to smoking. And, you know, lots of people had these stories about, oh, I knew my great uncle used to smoke and he was really fit as a Mallee bull at age 90 and things like that. You know, so you can always have some testimonial of, of some freak person, you know, who's just had dumb luck or whose body is just particularly resistant. That doesn't mean they're fit and healthy, you know. <laughs> the old grandfather might not have been able to walk up a hill. He might not have been sexually functional anymore. He might have been constipated every day. But he looked great. <laughs> yeah, and, and that was something I talked about in my presentation. You know, like um, I, I gave examples in that presentation of how whole foods plant-based you be a poor, apparently lean, fit, healthy women. Um one of them was Jenny, my partner. She had the best cholesterol results. The, the leanest, fittest, youngest of the lot. 
was uh, um, doing a high meat, high protein diet because she was into, I don't know, some sort of um, power exercise. And she had terrible cholesterol and she had high urea levels. Um, she would have smelt, <laughs> sweat would have smelt, her breath would have smelt from all that meat because it does that. A lot of the um, bad odors in uh, breath, sweat actually come from uh, um, like um, uh, volatile sulfur compounds that, that sort of evolve in your colon when meat sort of decays in the colon when the remnants of meat. Uh, also, she even had a slightly elevated liver enzyme, like, she, you know, maybe a bit of fatty liver or liver inflammation, a fit young woman. But there would be others sort of doing that like her, and there'd be the odd person who, whose blood cholesterol would actually look pretty reasonable. And if people are in a stage of weight loss, you know, if someone's been rapidly losing weight for a few months, things like blood cholesterol and blood sugar will improve regardless of what they're doing. Well, just about regardless, I mean, uh, of most people, I guess, if they're even losing weight and eating um, high protein, therefore meat or saturated fat, cholesterol, even meat protein itself, um, generally, you know, their cholesterol profile will tend to get worse. But even if it doesn't, there are all these other things happening in that body. There's inflammation, there's lack of antioxidants, there's that TMAO that, that you, your gut microbiome makes out of um, substances in meat and eggs and other animal products. There's an awful lot going inside the human body that we can't measure, like with the endothelium, the lining of the arteries, there's constantly sort of replacement cells coming out of the bone marrow. Uh, Dean Ornish says that when people are on these high meat diets, you know, that you can measure that there's less of those in their blood, less sort of uh, precursor cells to, to generate new healthy endothelium. So, yeah, and there's often a lot of things that are sort of like, before you can detect um, plaque cholesterol buildup in your arteries, by the time we see it on the scan, it may actually be that there's an awful lot of it all over the body before you can see it. You know, I'm sure I've got prostate prostate um, micro cancers from my youth and dairy, all that dairy I drank in earlier life and things. Um, and of course, no one sees them. You know, it's sort of like pre-cancer lesions. No one's going to see them. And more recently, I've thought of this idea that, you know, there's tipping points in climate change. Like you heat up the earth and then the Arctic, the, the, the tundra releases more methane. It heats up even more. You melt the ice and then the, the sea or the land absorbs even more heat. You know, I suspect this happens in the human body as well, that you keep stressing part of your system, whether it's your immune system with autoimmune, you know, and or with diabetes, diabetes, you know, you get more and more insulin resistant from all that fat in the muscle cells. And your pancreas just dutifully makes more and more insulin until just one day it hits a tipping point where it just can't quite keep up. And then it's like the body flips into that diabetic state and in the state of type 2 diabetes, all these other metabolic inflammatory changes happen that actually sort of worsen it, perpetuate it. And, you know, autoimmune disease, it's sort of like, well, you might have a few autoantibodies in your blood and be apparently okay, but at some point it might flip and tip over. And going back to the climate change analogy, uh, and the climate scientists give us the answer here. They say, look, well before you heat the earth enough for the tundra to release all the methane or the Arctic to stop reflecting sunlight, it's easy to act now before it all happens. Once you go past a tipping point, once you've already got the diabetes, you've got the autoimmune disease, you've got the gut micro, micro dysbiosis, it's going to take a lot harder work to actually reverse it or even just hold things where they are. And that's the same with heart disease. You know, like, if you, it, it's much, it takes much less dietary adherence and, and effort to stave off heart disease than to try and reverse it. It's so true. And like, like you did, we also talked about before, it's just that we are, it's, so, it's such a shame that we, most of hum humanity, tend to wait until that we reach that tipping point, until we're like, all right, there's literally nothing, there's no place to go back to because now we're this sick. Like, we can't go backwards, so we have to now take the, you know, do the work towards to prevent climate change because there's nothing, because we've... Take the more drastic action. Yeah! <laughs> For our own health. So it sucks that we like to push it into the very last moment before we're like, all right, then I'll put my oil down. I think of the, city, <laughs> I, think of the city I live in Melbourne, like 
you know, there was all these big works and digging up big city streets to put this, you know, subway rail system in there. You know, we waited till Melbourne was just about choked for transport before we suddenly started, you know, doing things about it. That is so true. That is so true. I was just, I was re- anyway, that's, yeah, I agree. I agree completely. We do it all the time in every area, education, medical, like, you know, the fact that we still have the food in our hospitals that we have today blows my my mind but you know we have to wait until you know until we go further down the slope (laughs) before we're going to see action in those areas as well i guess yeah it's almost like um you know like we're not going to take the bacon off the hospital menu until bacon sold in plain packaging with warning labels on it yeah although i must say the uh the the u.s uh, medical association have come out against that, against, you know, for, about hospital food. Recently, uh, my union, the AMA, and I wish I'd had some input, but I never knew they were doing a, a position statement on nutrition. Uh, that came out um, uh, last, early this month. And I was pleased to see that at least it said um, that, that they advocated more plant-based meal options in uh, hospitals and healthcare facilities. So there was some acknowledgement there. Oh, that's great. Because to me, if I see anyone's hospital food, I just think, are you kidding me? This is... Here's something funny. First year medicine, Flinders, 1978. Before the beginning of the course, the, some of the dietitians briefly spoke to us, sort of introducing themselves to us, and more or less said, don't blame us for the general hospital food. You know, that's nothing to do with us. We only do the special meals. <gasps> no, I can remember my brother, he had muscular dystrophy, and he... um you know, he had all different kinds of terrible things, but he had a dietitian and all he ended up having to eat through a a peg feed in his stomach. And he, um, he was terribly, terribly, terribly constipated, too much information listeners, but he was, (laughs) it was just debilitating and so sad that he had to live with that. Um, because the muscles couldn't you know, help push the food through. And the, I bet that pig um, food, the, the, the chew. It was all sustagen, yeah, just all sustagen with no dairy, fiber and dairy, dairy and nothing. Yeah, yeah. And I just think now, I didn't know then because he died before I really started looking into nutrition and now I just think, oh, my gosh, like if I'd known, I would have put other things like a smoothie in his. You know, in you his, know there are some people in the world. With Absolutely greens and stuff in there. We're starting to talk about that, like, uh, well, what would happen if we sort of tried to put a smoothie through the tube? It would probably work. There's been, oh, I can't remember who it is, but there's some, some health workers who have actually, you know, sort of been playing with that and trying it out. Surely it would work, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think as long as it was um, uh, you know, really well, well blended. blended up, yeah, it would work. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah, so I remember seeing that and now and looking back and just going, oh, my gosh, for like two years he was just eating these sustagen milk protein drinks and then nothing to help his food move through. So, of course, he was terribly constipated. Mm-hmm. Now, getting back to some of my patients. Um, please, please, please do. <laughs> first of all, following on from the thing about, you know, at, at doing it more 100% is... Um, you know, I know I'm just repeating what Dean Ornish and other people say. It's like people sometimes start off, you know, doing whole foods plant-based because, you know, they've, they've had a heart diagnosis. Um, just thinking of one guy who, again, would have been, you know, probably about a 50-year-old. Um, something that often keeps people going is the experience of wellness. Like, I remember this particular guy, you know, he, he had a heart disease diagnosis. I don't see him often because he doesn't actually live in, in Melbourne. Um, but last time I saw him, he, he runs a small business. And he was saying to me, you know, he's saying, Malcolm, or whatever he's calling me, he's saying, um, um, you know, I, I'm at the front counter. I'm taking phone calls. I'm directing the, the, uh, the staff out the back. I'm dealing with customers. And he says, and it's like uh, I'm less stressed and my mind's much sharper. It's like more going back to how how efficiently my brain and, and memory and everything worked when I was, you know, back in my 20s. 
Um, so, you know, when people experience things like that, when they actually feel well, when their body works better, when their mood's better, um, that's 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 a, a better long-term motivator than, you know, I'm worried that one day I'll die of prostate cancer. You'd, you'd think that if you went to the doctor, and that's what you're talking about, constipation, and I tell you, I, I'm sure I see a lot more hemorrhoid sort of, you know, constipation sort of problems than I ever used to. Um, maybe it's because people are no longer eating the sandwich for lunch, even if it's white bread, it's still got some fibre, because maybe they're not eating the potato, they're just, you know, eating more and more animal products, more oil, uh, dairy, you know, cheese consumption has gone up, for whatever reason. And I'm always pointing out the fibre to people, and they all think they eat a lot of fibre, it's not my job to shame them or anything, that, that, won't, that won't win me any sort of uh, um, um, health coaching points. And um, in terms of the fibre, I'm always trying, you know, remind them about what foods have got fibre, and but also foods that haven't got fibre. Like, you know, when you're eating more foods that have got zero fibre, then you're eating less foods that have. So foods that have zero fibre are things like chicken, dairy products, oil, um, and things that have got fibre you know, are whole grains and beans and vegetables and fruits because otherwise people tend to treat dietary fibre like it's a little supplement. You know, like um, um, I had one piece of wholemeal bread this morning or two spoonfuls of muesli and I had, um, you know, the minimum um, recommended amount of vegetables with my dinner and a lettuce leaf for lunch. So I've done my fibre. And I'm always trying to bring people to remind them that, you know, what foods have got you know, that displacement concept. You know, if you eat more of oil, then you eat less of beans or some other food that stores nutrients and, and fiber. In this case, we're talking about fiber. And also I get people, even when I prescribe, you know, someone I don't know and I'm prescribing them a cholesterol tablet. Um, you know, I try not to be really annoying, but it would be unethical, unconscionable for me to give a young woman a high-risk anti-acne pill without telling her about dairy's association with acne, or for a 40-year-old man to give him another cholesterol tablet repeat prescription without saying to him, you know, and, and they always start, I, had, I remember one man, the whole time I sort of did a, spoke for just a few sentences about um, how he could lower his cholesterol diet, he just kept repeating my mother had high cholesterol, my mother had high cholesterol, like it's genetic. So I've got a strategy for that now. Now, I say to, I say to these uh, men and women, but particularly like the, the, the men, once they get to the 40s and 50s, it's amazing how high their cholesterols are. And the women, it's often, often but not always, often a little bit older before theirs is really high. Um, I, I say to them, wherever your cholesterol starts at through your genes and other factors, if you eat more, and I start with foods that I think of as healthy animal products, if you eat more fish and chicken and eggs and dairy and red meat, it will go up and I lift my hands, I lift my palms upwards doing an up motion. And, and I say, and if you eat more um, oats and beans and other whole plant foods, it will actually come down. And I do that palms down sort of movement. So then I'm in a position where I've told them, I've given them the information which, you know, even if they haven't listened or gazed off into space, you know, um, you know, I, I've, it's I've been ethical. Um, and there's no point with that question. That the, the way I put it, they can't really, you know, sort of argue to themselves that it's all genetic. Oh, okay. So I, I actually would love you to, because my mum, just hello mum, <laughs> if you're listening to this episode when it comes out, she has high cholesterol and she... Went whole food plant based and surprise, surprise, it lowered. And then she started to be moderation and eating more and more and more and more of the eggs and the not dairy. She stayed away from dairy, but she has more seafood, more animal products, bits and pieces. And she you know, has friends over, so she makes a roast for them and bits and bobs of the, the, and she said and yesterday she said to me, I've gone up and I've I, you know, I had two eggs because I was so upset that it so upset that it's gone up and I'm trying so hard. And she said out of, oh, you know, it's all so hard. My dad had it. His dad had it. Their dad had it. All of them died of heart disease. Ten brothers. It's just going to be the way it is, Corinne. So if those people you said that you talk about, you know, if you eat less meat, it goes down. If they eat 
if they eat fish, fish, you know, when you eat, when you eat, I say when you eat fish, chicken, and go through the animal products, it, your cholesterol will go up. And I'm doing my palms up movement, and when you eat these other foods, it'll go down. So just, it's really like I'm just telling a basic fact. Subtle. And you have to be very careful yeah. with patients that they don't feel like you're criticizing, judging them. And there's a particular demographic, the 30 year old female, who are often ultra sensitive. Like it doesn't matter that she's overweight. Has still has ac- acne problems at age 30, had a gallbladder when she was 25. If you sort of suddenly say, you know, there's probably some dietary changes that could help some of these things. It's like, um, I even one person just about slammed their fist on the table and my diet's good. And, and, you know, we put this on women that, you know, they often have a lot of guilt about their diet and their weight. And, um, you know, people often just make the statement. They sort of stop there in the tracks. No, 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 no. My diet's good. At that point, you sort of have to try and sometimes you just have to drop it. Other times, you have to just be very careful that what you're recommending is just a, this advice is of a general nature for people with acne, you know, without sort of targeting them, without making it sound like you're criticizing them personally for their diet, which they consider as good. So, yeah, you'd be surprised. You know, you might think, the vegan people might often think that the doctor says, you know, those dairy foods could be could be worsening acne and the patient goes ah oh, doctor thank you thank you no one told me that no no it's not like that at all you know what is interesting is that sometimes i actually make a little note on file like not receptive to dietary change in other words you know, they almost did a bit of a dummy spit just at the concept that there were dietary things that could help their condition only to have them come back you know a many months or a year later and sort of saying okay now um I've given up dairy food. Um, like, what do you think I should eat instead of uh, meat? Um, so it's sometimes surprising, yeah. And, and that's why I think it's important for health professionals to always give people, even if you're just dropping a little tiny pearl, a little like a fishing, a little fishing lure, um, you know, on, on offer for them to take the bait because you really never know who's going to take it. And I'm always hopeful that people who have sort of seem to have ignored me or didn't think it was much of an idea they'll have some daughter or someone else one day or they'll see forks over knives and I just hope that my little cue will sort of add to the other cues and I'll go okay yeah I'll do this yeah I think it's it's, it's so true because I you know it, I'm not a doctor but I have got a, a bit of a sledgehammer <laughs> approach which does not always attract <laughs> Well, isn't isn't well received all the time. So I have to. I've had to learn to because when it's your family and friends, it's much easier to get very impassioned about their health and well being, which isn't well received. So yeah, it's definitely been a learning for me to be like because I've had such great success with my multiple sclerosis and fibromyalgia and constipation and obesity and all these things. I just think everyone just try this. It's amazing miracle cure. But then. Like you say from your work, and and you think you said other night you said it as well that yeah this is like a religion. Food is like a religion. Changing your diet is like asking someone to go from being Christian to Muslim or to Kim, go from Kim Williams. Kim Williams said that, didn't he? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. it is like he was that. Talking about the um, like his, I think he was talking about the older African American men. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's it's a big thing. I, I always think, you know, the Doug Lyle, you know, psychologist, it seems to work for me, sort of setting a good example, like, you know, yeah, I'm enjoying my food, I'm eating lots of it, and I look really lean and healthy, you know. And uh, and I, I think, you know, setting an example like that's really important. But it's we're always surprised about how few people notice that. Like Jenny and I are a member of a ski club, you know, and there could be up to 40 people there. And there's a huge communal dining lounge area and there's a sort of commercial kitchen. And, and breakfast is gross and it's, you know, provided for people. But the uh, lunch, evening meals, sort of people just, it, it, it sort of do it yourself and you all have your own fridge space and cupboard space and there's lots and lots of, you know, it's a giant commercial kitchen that you'll, people tend to form groups and cooking little groups. Actually, you know, it's like sometimes I'm an anthropologist there. It's like, I remember one group, it wasn't that their meal was based around meat, like it was meat. But anyway, you'd think after going there, Jenny and I have been going there for a number of years. 
you, there could be someone who'd go, gee, you do a lean and healthy, good skin tone, Malcolm skis all day, you, you know, you, you obviously you're well into your 50s, um, and you're eating differently. What are you doing? For the first time in years and years, this actually happened to us last ski season, but it's about the first time when a lady started talking to Jenny about, well, mm, look how much of this food you're eating, and you seem to be so lean and healthy. Jenny happened to have the Forks Over Knives documentary. Ah! <laughs> Other material with her down the TV room that night or the next night. Yeah, they'd, they'd pretty much, I think after watching Forks Over Knives, they decided that they'd finished the meat they brought with them and then, um, then uh, they'd go home and make the complete transition. Anyway, they've left at the end of the week. We're still there on the day they left. Another young guy moves into their uh, their space, their room, opens up the fridge, do you know, uh, fridge space number, whatever, and says, oh, someone's left their meat behind. <laughs> they decided that, no, they wouldn't finish off the meat that they were brought with, and that changed straight away. That's so good. Uh, it's funny, a lot of people, like my parents, they're like, oh, we'll eat the meat. So I emptied out their fridge recently because my dad got um, prostate cancer and so I went there and gutted their <laughs> pantry and and, the, and they're like, no, leave the meat. And I'm just thinking, I, I, we'll finish off the meat and then we'll do it. And I just think that's such a funny thing. Like it's already dead. You've already spent the money. Just, just. It's like when people, um, you know, when someone's had more, more calories. <laughs> yeah, it's like when someone's had more calories than they need. And, you know, they don't want to waste the food on the plate, but it's wasted either way. You know, if you eat something that you don't need or is bad for you or whether you put it in the bin, it's still wasted. Then there's a dilemma when you're cleaning out a pantry or, or kitchen when someone's cleaning it out. Like, what do I do with this product? I know it's harmful. <laughs> like, do you, do you give the bacon to someone you hate? Is that malicious? Do you give it to somebody you like? <laughs> We gave it to my auntie because my mum was like, oh, she, you know, she, 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 I felt so bad. Some things I was like, no one should eat this. And I threw it directly into the bin. If it was really like, like they were all things that were bad for you. Sorry, Auntie Shirley. But they were, there were some things that were worse and I put them immediately in the bin. But yes. Oh God. I did feel bad. I did feel bad. (laughs) But mum was like, I'm not throwing them out. that being that you had some consideration for Auntie Shirley's health. <laughs> I'm sure she was happy with the food. <laughs> but to me, it wasn't food. Sorry, Auntie Shirley. I feel really bad now. I'll give you a hug when I see you next time. Sorry for giving you the food that I think's poison. <laughs> Earlier on, you asked me about, um, you know, paleo, Atkins, high meat diets. And, uh, you know, it's really unfortunate that this has been fueled by, you know, um, like our, our dietitian should be fighting back more strongly against this. Um, you know, unfortunately, we've got, you know, that branch of the CSIRO that are sort of, um, you know, put out the um, CSIRO low-carb diet. Uh, and um, interesting, some of the research that's been done to sort of show that low-carb diets are all right for diabetes, it's like they compare it with a, you know, with a diet that's not all that high in carbohydrate that still has meat in it that's, you know, a fairly crappy diet. And they find that their slightly higher animal protein and oil, canola oil diet, in general, doesn't didn't make the patients, <laughs> didn't do any worse than the standard crappy diet. And from that comes the idea, therefore, you should eat high protein. And I, I hate the high protein idea, or even just like people calling food protein. Like, you know, I don't run along the Yarrow and say, you know, well, I guess it is water, but it's sort of not like, you know, it's a whole package deal. Um, you know, and it's like, why not call the meat cholesterol or saturated fat or uh, heterocyclic amines or, or, you know, all, all the other things in there that are going to harm our health, the whole package or unfiber or un antioxidant, you know, whatever. There might be little tiny bits of research that compare, you know, um, someone on a limited calorie weight loss diet eating more animal protein foods versus someone on a crappy diet. And that's always the key with research. If you want to show that something works, compare it with something worse. You know, if you want to do a Mediterranean diet with red meat, it was one of the sponsors, and fish and tons of olive oil here in Australia, then um, this particular research, you couldn't get into the study if you had an average Australian diet. You actually had to have a worse than average before you were accepted into this uh, Victorian study. So compare it to something worse. 
But I, I think that, you know, if you look at the people tend to, and, and the practitioners, they drive me crazy sometimes in the medical practitioners group and what they write in the medical magazines and the doctors who are sort of uh, saturated fatters, <laughs> you know, people who are sort of saying, oh, the saturated fat's all right. And the actual fact, it was always the sugar, the saturated fat's all right, you know, eat more meat, fat, rich dairy. And they drive me crazy because, you know, they go, oh, look, we have here we have with the Pure study, it showed that really poor people eating white rice and sugar, you know, in some really poor part of Bangladesh had worse health than the wealthier people somewhere else eating a bit of meat and dairy. It's like, yeah, you sort of, <laughs> I could have told you that would happen. But generally speaking, so they pick little tiny bits of research out. Um, often comparing it to something worse. Whereas if you look at the broad picture of all the published research over the decades, really over the last hundred years, there's just ample research to show that when you eat more whole grains, legumes, vegetables, fruits, when you eat a more plant-based diet, a more vegetarian, a more vegan diet, there are better health outcomes. When people eat um, larger amounts of meat and full-fat dairy foods, they get worse health, health outcomes. You know, uh, so, um, you know, the fact that they're actually promoting those sort of diets is pretty appalling. And particularly now that we understand the mechanisms, like, you know, we understand TMAO and how it raises cholesterol and the inflammation. And, and we understand, you know, the micro, what's going on in the gut and how, you know, carcinogens are being generated. Well, but just to um, add on to that. I know a lot of people, because there was the low fat movement after with the heart, with heart disease prevention. And so everyone started to get low fat milk, low fat yogurt. Um, it's now swung back. It's now swung back. Yeah. So it's swung back so to whole. Dairy's still down. Dairy's still down. But I think the, um, the low fat milk's not as big a proportion. An interesting aside here is that, you know, journalists, I think it's Nina Teicholz or someone, one of those journalists anyway, you know, and, and all of the saturated fatters. It's not what they, they actually eat meat and chicken and fat, fat rich dairy food. But going back to um, um, this idea that this idea that it's either sugar or fat, that back in the 1970s and 80s, people like people in America adopted a low fat diet and they just ate more sugar and they got fatter. Dean Ornish shows the slides which show that each decade from the 1950s through to the present, or at least through to 2010, with every decade, Americans actually ate more fat. There never was a low fat era. There never was an era when uh, Americans, and it probably applies to Australians as well, there never was an era where they actually reduced their fat intake. They, they increased their calorie intakes each decade as well. Some of that might have been, you know, Twinkies and uh, soft drinks and things. So that's a bit of a myth. So if, so if they were consuming lower fat products, how were they having more well, fat? Well, they weren't actually consuming that many lower fat products. They were still eating steak. They were still eating chicken. Um, you know, fried chicken places came along. So, you know, they're eating, like Australians, they're eating a lot more cheese than they used to. And that's really just concentrated milk, fat and protein, oh, plus a few cow hormones and other bits. Um, so, Pus. yeah, a bit of that too. Just only a little bit. What? Just a hint though. So, <laughs> and it's cooked, so it doesn't, it's not even gross when it's cooked. Australians <laughs> and Americans never really, there were some low fat products come out. And, you know, there were some pretty appalling ones as well, trying to jump on the bandwagon. But we never sort of adopted that en masse enough to sort of make a huge change to a whole population. Uh, and this, you know, idea that the saturated fat is put out there that like it's either going to be eggs for breakfast or cocoa pops, you know, it's going to be fats or carbs. It's, you're like, well, what about, I, I don't, that's not, it's not a dichotomy. I can have oats. <laughs> Do I have to have cocoa pops? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's never, it's never um, a sugar fat seesaw. In fact, King Williams, um, uh, a couple of nights ago, he, he showed this slide of, you know, several decades old now, uh, a few decades old, looking at different countries in the world and the, the um, how much sugar they consumed and how much uh, saturated fat they consumed. And the two go almost exactly together, you know, like uh, uh, Australia and US are way up on both. Japan was way, way down on both. So, you know, the two do travel together. Think of something like, uh, in terms of processed food, Think of something like a donut or chocolate or ice cream. You know, that's high sugar, high fat food. 
I just want to ask you, this this popped into my head the other day because a lot of people talk about orthorexia these days when you talk about adopting a whole fat, low food, plant-based diet. Like, oh gosh, you're going to go, you're going too far. You know, you're obsessed about what you eat. You're obsessed about the food that you're eating. Like it's this, and and I'm not saying that, I'm not dismissing that it can get to uh, some young women, especially and young men who are wanting to be super fit and healthy are possibly um, actually have an eating disorder, disordered eating. Look, I, 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 um, I, do, occasionally, I do occasionally see them. I, I do occasionally um, see them. And actually I'm sort of, what comes to mind is um, you know, males equally to females. I do occasionally see these people. It, it's not that they need to loosen up and eat a donut or some chicken. It's just that they need to sort of, you know, be a bit relaxed, more relaxed about it and, uh, you know, but so I do see those people. But I'm appalled when I go to some, uh, when I, you know, read one of my medical magazines or, I don't know, one of the, maybe one of the nutritionist associations that I won't name, actually had, had a section on orthorexia. And one of the criteria was you choose food more based on that being healthy than because you like it. And it's like, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll do that. That's actually what I'd recommend people do. You know, I mean, we know we have, you know, fat-rich, salty food like cheese will attract many people if they don't find it disgusting. I would now. And uh, we have manufacturers make snack foods with exactly the right qualities to be totally addictive for a human. Um, You know, and and they're saying that if you go, no, 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 I'm not going to have the crispy biscuits. I'm I'm actually going to have, um, you know, some... uh, Carrot sticks and hummus. Yeah, yeah, or or some sort of healthy food. I think think it's a bit of a fight back. You know, the orthorexia, yeah, there is a problem with people who get totally over-obsessed about food. And that's, you know, generally more people I've seen with them, it's it's not always that the whole food's part based, it's just they're obsessed. I was just thinking that it's funny that we're leading to having like a hundred, I think it was Kim Williams or it might have been, I don't know where else I heard it, but that basically we're le- we're heading towards having 100% of the population obese or overweight. And rather than focusing on the level of obesity, we're like, oh, no, but don't eat healthy because you might get orthorexia. <laughs> yeah, it's bizarre, isn't it? Don't, don't, choose the, don't choose the very healthiest food if there's something that, you know, might sort of, give you a bit more of a pleasure dopamine rush. It's, I found it just funny. Anyway, I just was thinking about it, thinking like orthorexia is this huge big thing when obesity is literally this huge big yeah, it's thing. Yeah, like, um, you know, the, the focus on food and, you know, young women's eating habits and things, um, you know, um, anorexia can be really bad and there's a very small, but I can, my personal experience in dealing with these people is that, like I often can't help them because you know only if they're they're mild and actually willing to eat can I, I can't really help people to eat healthy when they're not eating. Um, there's a lot more to generally I find the, uh, the the young ladies with anorexia generally have a sort of um, much broader mental health problem than than just trying to be thin or limiting food. Um, there's a whole lot of other personality thinking things that go along with it. Um, but yeah, it's always been bizarre over the years that we've been, you know, um, three quarters focused on not wanting anyone to develop the anorexia disorder and sort of like um, being a bit obese, getting a bit obese, a bit of breast cancer, eventually heart disease, like, you know, no, 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 we're not as worried about that. But, um, you know, in terms of sheer numbers and impact on people's health and quality of life, um, it's a much, much huger problem. I mean, it's like nearly everyone, like two out of three people in our country, you know, perhaps have an eating disorder. But, you know, it's not their fault. It's not their fault. And I think part of the whole thing with the sugar is, you know, sort of like, yeah, it's a sugar making people obese, even though we know that sugar consumption hasn't gone up. Like it was actually higher back in about um, 60s, 1970, something like that. It actually came down a bit and it's been pretty level. And, um, um, you know, I think we're sort of putting on people that it's things like the sugar and the fast food. And my, my, my sort of... Um, um, uh, lifestyle medicine, sort of Australian people and things, often to always talking about the processed food and the sugar, you know. But these people who are getting obese are uh, trying to do the right thing. By and by, you know, there are an awful lot of people out there, even most people, they're trying to do the right thing. 
they're given the wrong information. They're pouring oil over their salads and their food. I see them as patients. Oh, I was pouring oil on my food because I thought it was healthy. You know, and of course it just means that they systematically overeat because of that super concentrated calories and stuff. And then there's all the stuff about, um, you know, lean protein to get to, to, you know, give you satiety and stay lean. And yet, you know, the research shows that people who eat less animal protein are leaner. And the you know, big epic study in Europe shows that people who eat more meat, particularly chicken, are gaining weight more. Um, so there are all these people out there who are, you know, often quite educated, really trying to do the right thing. You know, they're not drinking soft drinks, but they've all food's got oil on it. They're trying not to eat potatoes and whole grains, which, you know, would actually help them. They're, um, they're eating lots of, you know, chicken and tuna and they're eating some eggs and things. And so I, I think it's a great shame that the wrong information's been given to people who, if, if, our nutritionists, our organisations um, would actually say to them, look, um, you'd be better off not having oil or hardly having any and eat more plant-based, eat a more vegan diet, eat, eat some whole grains. Um, then many of these people would actually be willing to do it. Can I ask you, I am, I've heard a lot of people say, um, including you know, Dr. Neil Bernard, Dr. Kleiper, Dr. Gregor, yourself, I think, Dr. Kim Williams may possibly have said it, and Dr. McDougall, that the fat, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. So why is it that people who eat tons, paleo, keto, people can eat their egg omelets with their halloumi and their bacon on the side, but bread free, of course. <laughs> why can they eat these high fat foods and and be leanest they've ever been and be feel the best they've ever felt? Like why do that? Why do they lose weight when they are eating such high fat diets? You know, they don't always feel the best they could. Like if you look at some of the research funded by the Atkins Foundation, it's like felt lousy, got headaches, constipated, body odor, um, but. You know, if you went on a sort of diet that was going to be sort of paleo, um, and you cut out, you wouldn't be buying fried chip, fried uh, uh, French fries. You know, a little thin McDonald's French fries. Uh, you might even stop eating cheese. There's going to be an awful lot of little junk foods and snack foods that you're not going to have anymore. Um, you know, so you've got to restrict your calorie intake. And if you do a full-on sort of paleo, high-fat, really low-carb, you, you might feel a bit nauseated as well. Some of that stuff, it's sitting in your stomach. And also, you know that you're doing something and you're doing it straight. So there goes the dairy, there goes, you know, hopefully there goes some of the oil, although strangely, paleo man on the savanna found a puddle of coconut oil. Uh, so some of it obviously doesn't make much sense at all, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, no, people can lose weight, but in the long term, in the long term, the weight loss stats are, are not as impressive for people who adopt high meat, sort of high fat diets. You know, the, the short term results um, are pretty good, as they would be if you went totally low fat, whole foods, plant based. The, the short term results are also good. Um, and then there are sort of like I say to people, you know, there are some side effects of uh, low carb diets like um, mortality. Just a little bit of mortality. Yeah, just a little bit. I actually, because people often send me those articles, like, like I said, and I thought, you know what, maybe I'm living in this echo chamber hearing only positive stories because I have a podcast about recovery stories of low-fat, whole-food, plant-based diet, and I speak to doctors like yourself who tell me all the things that I you know, reinforce, the things that I already believe. So I, other week I thought, you know what, I'm going to Google – because Pete Evans is talking about paleo and it's this miracle cure of everything and all these people are talking about it. I'm going to Google um, diseases cured, you know, heart disease cured by paleo diet. I'm going to Google cancer cured by it or multiple sclerosis or all these things. And surprisingly, there was nothing. <laughs> there was like nothing. There was, there was nothing. There's one very not scientific, not, it was, I didn't think it was anything to go by. In all of my research, when in a simple Google of the same for low-fat, whole-food, plant-based diet, there's reams of results, reams of research, long-term findings, testimonials. There's so much. And there was just crickets when I did the opposite for high-fat high fat diets into the search engine. So I was like, okay, well, I am, I am in an echo chamber, but the 
there's not there's nothing in the other in the other area anyway if you look, if you do the research for yourself yeah interesting point how we tend to get an echo chamber or a, a u loop as it's called a u loop as in y o u u loop like like for example you know you search something on google and it comes up with answers and you think everyone and you think wow that's high up on the rating but someone else will get a different answer you know so now with our social media and our search engines and things they spin us into even more of a you loop. You know, Facebook only feeds us to, you know, lets us see people's comments to people's posts who, you know, we often interact with. Yeah, but, yeah, it's certainly um, true that um, only, it's only a whole foods plant-based diet that has been shown to reverse heart disease. Sure, various Mediterranean diets and things have been shown to have less, on heart attacks during the course of the study, less heart events than, um, uh, or less strokes in particular, in that particular study I'm thinking of, than an even worse diet. But only it's only really the whole foods, plant-based diet, you know, uh, low-fat, plant-based, mostly whole foods diet, that's actually been shown to reverse heart disease. With diabetes, you know, um, in the early stages of diabetes, um, you know, even just losing an enormous amount of weight, you know, would uh, would reverse the diabetes. You could probably eat, eat those legendary US Twinkies in small amounts or beer in small amounts and still reverse the diabetes if you are enormously overweight and lost weight early on. Um, but, uh, you know, as far as what diet's more effective for weight loss, uh, a researcher whose name escapes my mind mo momentarily, he actually um, has sort of metabolic ward studies where they, they, you know, people in a closed system, they're measuring their sort of, you know, oxygen consumption and they're precisely measuring their calories. And he found that um, it didn't make any difference, that there was no sort of clinically significant difference between, um, you know, if you went on a ketogenic low-carb diet, like you still lost weight according to the calories. As far as everyone talking about, you know, the fat you eat and the fat you wear, there's two factors there. One is that the high fat foods are generally a lot higher in calories. You know, like meats twice, beans and and, and uh, nuts, just despite being healthy in small amounts, are really high in calories. In fact, Jenny and I were looking at some uh, low carb bread today in the specialty shop. Boy, that packed a lot of calories because it was made out of um, almond and, and coconut rather than flour. And uh, being much higher in fat, I was like about you know, at least twice as high in calories. And the other thing is the human body sort of runs very nicely on starches, on carbs. And your body will sort of try and store and squirrel away for later in your liver and your muscles, etc., the carbohydrates. And if it needs to take those carbs and break them down and into fats for storage, which obviously it will do if you keep piling them in, um, it actually loses about a quarter of the calories in the process. So for that, that's sort of those two reasons are sort of – and a third reason too is that the type of carbs we talk about always have dietary fiber. And they're up, so they're often a bit bulky. So those three reasons that fatty, high-fat foods are much higher in calories, that the, hum, that, that the conversion of carbohydrates to fat um, loses is inefficient, and, and that the uh, high-carb foods that we talk about are usually high in fiber and bulky. Those three reasons um, um, mean that you're much more likely to get leaner, to stay lean, not to put on uh, body fat on uh, a low-fat plant-based diet. The studies that haven't been done to it um, enough is comparing eating whole plant foods as in whole grains and legumes versus eating whole plant foods as in um, what I would call too many <laughs> nuts and avocados and seeds and, and things like that. So it was a higher fat plant-based diet. And so far, the runs are on the board for the more starch-based whole plant foods and the fat-based ones as far as the populations out there, like where's the population of huge, you know, green zone group of people living on uh, almonds and avocados. And the runs are on the board for heart disease reversal, prostate cancer, diabetes, more for the, more for the plant-based diets that are more skewed towards the um, starch-rich plant foods rather than the fat-rich plant foods. So just to, from a non-medical, my own perspective, what you're saying with recalories, I think that 
when you're eating like a slice of that low carbohydrate bread that you're you saw, like it's all well and good, but it, you, what you're not well and good, but I mean just just for basic people like myself, if you eat that, you it's not gonna you can't. It's high in calories, so you have to, to fill up and be satiated. You might need to eat more of that and then have such a huge calorie load and it's more likely that you'll overeat calories throughout the day, which can lead to other, other like heart disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes. Is that is that the issue with like the low, low carb, high fat foods that they only a small amount in your belly, so you still feel like you need all this extra Got this room left in your stomach to add more high calorie foods, such as more of that nut, fat, that, that's avocado. That's part of it because um, um, you know we tend to eat. It's some research that shows that people tend to eat a uh, you know a similar volume of food with their meals, and so if you have higher fat food, if you're having nuts instead of oats, then it's a lot more calorie dense, and yeah, the stomach, the stomach will be totally stretched and full from you know, from, uh, um, you know, high, if you have, you know, um, rice and beans and vegetables, the stomach will be totally full, you know. Um, but if you're eating something that was more calorie concentrated and fat rich, then, yeah, you could eat the same number of calories and your, stomach's, your stomach might only be half full, you know. The, so in, while, while they talk about fats and proteins for satiety, satiety actually more seems to come from the actual bulk of food. Which is related to the to the uh, fibre and water in it, and the things that, and then the opposite is the higher fat content. Generally, the more calories for that volume of food. This is sort of a few other things. We actually wrote an FAQ on our website about sort of why, when everyone else said, when some of Australia's nutritionists go, low carb diets are dead, and all sorts of comments like that. Good fats, good fats. We actually wrote an FAQ about um, you know why we're still promoting. Um, you know, uh, a, a plant, whole foods plant-based diet that's, um, you know, very low in fat. And, you know, I, I'll say when people want to argue about this, it depends a bit, again, on the person, the patient. Like, you know, if I've got someone who's got obesity and they're a bit of a plateau or they're trying to reverse heart disease, then I'm really going to push that low-fat low whole plant foods bit more than I'm going to push it for an ultra-endurance runner who's apparently, you know, young and in good health. And, you know, he's probably got a bit more leeway to eat some uh, fat-rich plant-based foods. But I, I do see it. You know, I do see people who uh, – I've seen at least one patient who had, had moderately high cholesterol with their plant-based diet. And they are just they're eating a huge amount of nuts and seeds and, you know, going on good fats and stuff. You know, it shouldn't have had too much of an effect on their cholesterol. But I think just the calorie overload, just the concentrated calories hitting their liver – was probably enough to sort of cause all these changes, like an increase in um, liver cholesterol output. Uh, yeah, so that, that's sort of my position on the sort of <laughs> oily whole plant foods versus the starchy whole plant foods. And so people can read that FAQ that you and Jenny made up on the Plant Based Health Australia re- website? No, P- Plant Based Health Australia is our, um, our, our Facebook page. Um, the website's got a, it's a bit of a mouthful. Whole foods, plant-based health. Whole food, foods, plant-based health. Whole foods. Dot com dot au. Yeah, dot com dot au. Yeah, I mean, I think if you search plant-based health Australia, you'd, you'd get there. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. That's good. They can find it there. I think it's it's, it's such a fascinating topic for me. Uh, probably a lot for the listeners to um take on board because i think that that is still such it's just once you open this diet nutrition thing there's just so many differing perspectives and ideas and things i think most people are in a state of complete overwhelm which is why i kind of one of the reasons why i wanted this podcast to exist because just having a lot of people eating a very similar way on a low-fat whole food plant-based diet vegan diet um and thriving, at least you can be like, all right, I'm just going to pick one, pick this one, <laughs> and then go with it rather than having so much differing noise um, um, from everywhere. Yeah, not all that noise is accidental either. Like, you know, industry puts out all this stuff that's, you know, almost meant to keep people confused so that they default back to the sad, you know, standard Australian diet. 
I, th- I think that that's true too. Even though people might think that I'm a conspiracy theorist, but, but I think that that's, I think that that's true as well. Now we, I've taken up a lot of your time. So before I, I just want to quickly get in your, if you have three tips, your biggest tips for someone who's listening to this podcast or just thinking about adopting a low fat, whole food, plant-based diet, but it's like, I don't know where to begin. Like my partner's not vegan. My kids aren't vegan. I've beaten this way for 60 years. I don't know where to be. None of my friends are vegan. Where would you suggest they start? First of all, they need some good resources like our website or Emma Roche's book, Whole Foods Plant Based on $5 per day. I have to buy that book. I really want that book. I haven't got it yet. It sounds great. Yeah, we've got a few cartons of it. Secondly, um, keep it simple. Follow the simple plate model of having um, um, high fiber starchy foods on one side of the plate, you know, whole grains, legumes, potatoes, etc. And all your leafy greens and broccoli and other tomatoes and other vegetables on the other side of the plate. So the simple, very simple meal model. Um, and I guess thirdly, you know, I sort of like to give people hope that that they can do this. Sometimes if they set a shorter target, like, all right, can you do it for three, three or four? Can you do it just for four weeks? It doesn't sound as horrible as you'll never be able to eat cheese again in your life. Um, and, that, uh, and that you can do it and to give them hope that if they do this, that their health will uh, be restored or transformed. Yeah, I think that's so true. And I, I've mentioned it a lot of times because people often say to me, you know, what if you got multiple sclerosis again tomorrow, had a relapse tomorrow and, you know, and you've been eating this way, like, don't you miss, why would you keep eating this when you could have a relapse tomorrow? And I, I always default back to, like you, like you said earlier, like it isn't just my multiple sclerosis that has improved my energy, my mental fogs lifted. I have lost, you know, 30 plus kilos. I used to be chronically constipated. I used to be in chronic pain. Uh, in my my twenties were a complete write off. So even if I tomorrow woke up and I couldn't feel my legs at all, I would still eat this way <laughs> because of the multitude of benefits. It's not just the MS that's helped; it's helped with my whole they're, life. Uh, they're great side effects, like for MS treatment. No MS drugs give you those sort of good side effects, uh, and that sort of brings that sort of about the um, the breadth of effect of a whole foods plant based diet. That is. Um, you know, the same sort of dietary pattern that, that prevents heart disease will also be good for, or is good for heart disease, will also be good for diabetes, weight, will give you your best chance with autoimmune disease. And the same sort of diet that will, you know, prevent heart disease will actually um, um, reverse it. Um, yeah, so it's that like wide breadth of effect. And, you know, when I was saying this, and I put this into some seminars, um, we started doing seminars and I kept wanting to sort of kept feeling like I was selling some sort of miracle cure and so I sort of had to add something on to that and I said and uh, it sounds too much to be true that one sort of dietary approach could have that could sort of be good for everything but if you think of it as like that's just types of food that the human anatomy and physiology are sort of best designed to eat so that sort of explains why the sort of one broad dietary pattern works for so many things. Yes, it does. I often when I'm, because I'm in multiple sclerosis Facebook groups and I, it's a bit like your medical groups where I no one wants to hear about the whole food plant-based way and they I get no likes if I ever write anything <laughs> in there yeah, as well. I, I, I commented on there was an online article about paleo-saturated fats all right, Ansel Keys was a bully, all that sort of crap. Um, it was published, pre-published online before it was in the magazine, and I put a big comment there. And and in this particular comment stream, you could like and unlike. I was quite proud. I got a net of, and I thought I was being more polite than they were. I got a net of thirteen unlikes. Well, that the the, the comments actually they don't get they got very few likes, maybe none, and I get lots of hate, <laughs> mostly just furious hate <laughs> which is really sad i'm like i feel really great i've had ms for 
13, 14 years this year and I feel better than I ever have and I run 5K a day and I exercise and do Pilates and I all the yeah, list of all the positives and I just get reams of <laughs> reams of hateful me- and I get sometimes I get a private message that will say I saw your comment thank you so much like can you give me some more information <laughs> They won't say anything. That makes it more worthwhile. Yeah, it is worthwhile when that happens. But, yes, so it's just very funny because people don't want to, you know, people get so upset. It is a religion and they get so upset if they think that they're suffering. You're you're saying it's like you're blaming them and saying you did it to yourself. It's like whenever I see anyone with, you know, after breast cancer and I want to give them a bit of dietary advice, on uh, on not getting it back again or not going on with the other associated diseases like heart disease. It's always have to be so careful to phrase it in terms of, you know, like, okay, you know, we're not interested in what caused breast cancer. We're now we're interested in um, what can make it less likely to come back. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, it's like you're blaming them, or or if their friend had it, you're blaming their friend. Yeah, it's such a it's. A, lesson in diplomacy which I think that I need I've always needed my parents everyone who knows me can vouch that I need a lesson in diplomacy like every day and I think that your work would be like that you know to bring a doctor and knowing what you know and then having this 10 minute slots or 15 minute slots with patients to like you like you were mentioning you know you want to give them it's unethical not to give them just a little bit of information about diet but you don't want to be in their face or blaming and make them feel shamed or and and I don't want to do that either and no one wants to really do that we both we, everyone has the best interests of these people at heart which is why you became a doctor in the first in the first place I imagine yes yeah and uh, it is a constant challenge just you know keeping that balance between you know giving them the information that you really must give them and um, but, but and not just annoying them or shaming them or turning them off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Turning them off, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a tightrope balance. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. I was going to, I'm going to have to get you back on the show another time because I wanted to talk about soy and just a bit more about, you know, iron and B12 and those kinds of things. But I, you know, I've realised there's 142 and you're a working doctor, a man who have people to see and lives to help. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. So... So sorry for putting taking taking so long, but I just, I just loved talking to you, and I really loved hearing yeah, just your your expert expertise in history and experience, and on uh, people adopting a low fat whole food plant based diet because I obviously I believe that it's the best for people's health, and people who are listening may be suffering and would like to hear from a doctor as well, so they have not just recovery stories, but expert people talking about why this diet is so incredible for people's health. All right. Thank you, Corinne, for having me on your thank podcast. Thank you so much. And Sorry for taking that, up so much of your fine. time. Thank you for having me on your podcast. And I think you're doing a really great job out there with this podcast. I know I'm often listening to podcasts while I'm driving or sometimes when I'm running. And, yeah, I'd be quite happy to uh, uh, come along another day and uh, talk about, you know, um, you know, iron and soy and uh, protein and all, all those issues. Yeah, perhaps we can do a, just a little, a little short version just on the, the like calcium, iron, but just on just on those things that people who are nervous about getting everything that they need, just on those. That might, might just be a little, a little mini episode we could do one day, so, so that people could listen to it on a short run. <laughs> Thank you all for listening. If you want to learn more about Malcolm, you can find him at drmalcolmmackay.com.au. That's D-R-M-A-L-C-O-L-M-M-A-C-K-A-Y.com.au. And you can also find him at wholefoodsplantbasedhealth.com.au. So wholefoodsplantbasedhealth.com.au. And they have immersions, seminars, just tons and tons and tons of incredible information put together by Malcolm and his partner, Jenny Cameron. You can also find them, I highly recommend their, the group on on Facebook called Whole Food Plant-Based Aussies. It's a great group for people starting out, wanting more information, wanting to find recipes, community, other people eating and living this way. It's a great group, highly recommend Whole Food Plant-Based Aussies on Facebook. Okay, if you haven't yet subscribed to this podcast, I put out new episodes every Sunday slash Monday and 
I would love it so much if you could, if you liked this podcast or you like some of the podcasts you've listened to, if you could leave me a rating or a review, obviously five stars and a kind review would be what I'm after because otherwise I just get super offended. (laughs) Not really. But, you know, the more positive your ratings and reviews are, the more and the more the more people will hopefully find this podcast and receive their daily dose or their weekly dose of hope about the healing powers of plants, which is what this whole podcast is about. Thank you all and I'll see you next week.